Uh, now for something a little bit different. Uh, uh, and, and I'll also try to attract Yura to, that's another one, uh, to, uh, to look into uh, a different area. Uh, but one he's actually contributed to, uh, though he might not know it. So this is all about brains. Uh, and in particular, it's about ideas that have sprouted from Yudea's brain uh, and that have helped us to uh, understand uh, and think about how all of our brains work. So uh, the diagram on the left uh, is from a 1991 paper by Fellman and Van Essen. Uh, and it's meant to characterize uh, known structures in the brain. The little boxes correspond to uh, areas that were first identified by Brodmann uh, and then expanded as we uh, understood more about the brain. Uh, and they represent anatomical brains that are pieces of the brain that are anatomically different. The arcs correspond to uh, uh, relationships between those areas uh, that are quantified by uh, various kinds of axonal growth. Uh, when I first looked at this, I, I saw a graphical model. Uh, and uh, that was uh, over 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago. Uh, and at the time, uh, I was admired in other things. Uh, I got uh, sucked into administration, something that uh, I warn you all against. Uh, but five years later, I escaped, uh, and I started working on a model of the brain uh, that was based roughly on uh, this characterization. Um, Usually when people look at, when a neuroscientist looks at this portion, this portion of the brain, which is the, a portion of the cortex that's involved in vision, uh, they see two large pathways. One, the ventral pathway, uh, which is usually uh, cor corresponds to uh, how uh, we think about spa shape uh, and, uh, and, and objects, uh, the sort of uh, what of the world, uh, and the dorsal pathway uh, that's associated with how we think about where those, uh, those objects are uh, in our frame, various frames of reference, the frame of reference of our head, body, et cetera. Uh, I was particularly interested in the dorsal pathway uh, because I was interested in time. I was interested in building a generative predictive model uh, that captured something interesting about how the visual cortex worked. Uh, most of the work uh, um, in, in the area at the time was about the ventral pathway. Uh, and I was less interested in that because it had nothing to do with time. Uh, and uh, I thought that maybe I could make a contribution um, if I focused on uh, the dorsal pathway. Uh, my original models were hopelessly naive, uh, but luckily uh, I backed off a little bit uh, and I considered a much simpler model uh, that was due to my colleague uh, then at Brown, uh, David Mumford. Uh, and David's model, um, which was motivated in part uh, by Ulf Grenander's sort of generative pattern theoretic view of the world, uh, was a very simple model that characterized the stages uh, or the areas, the primary visual areas uh, in the ventral pathway. Uh, namely, uh, the assumption is that information entered from the retina uh, into area V1, uh, which is the striate cortex. Uh, and then it propagated through the layers uh, up through V2, uh, V4, and onto the inferotemporal cortex, IT, uh, which is responsible for shape as far as we know it. Now, this is a, a, a fairly straightforward model um, from Gudea's point of view, um, with the exception that if, if we were actually to put this into practice, um, we would have to expand out some of these variables and they get very complicated because they correspond to, uh, or they try to represent, millions and millions of variables. Um, David's wasn't the first model uh, to try to represent the ventral pathways. Um, much earlier work on sort of artificial neural networks by Fukushima, something called the neocognitron, um, tried to capture some of the interesting uh, ideas, but it wasn't couched uh, in probabilistic terms. Um, Later on, um, Jeffrey Hinton, Jeff Hinton uh, developed a, a model which did have probabilistic semantics, um, although he wrote a little roughshod over them uh, later on when he was doing inference. The learning was, uh, was generally uh, true to the probabilistic semantics. Um, Jeff had one, a couple of interesting ideas in this. Uh, one of them was that, that the way in which you learn these models is you learn them layer by layer. Um, and as a consequence, um, he was able to learn models that no one else had been able uh, to come close to. Um, 
this is some work uh, from Andrew Ng's group uh, at Stanford, uh, and it shows what happens uh, when um, you, you do some clever optimizations uh, to extend uh, the simpler model that, that Jeff had developed. Uh, these, air, these levels, as it were, represent different areas of the cortex. You can think of them as intermediate steps along the ventral pathway. Um, and at the lowest level, um, it seems that the representation uh, that, uh, that we have is one of uh, uh, oriented bars um, at different scales. Uh, and a little bit more high level, um, they, there are a, a variety of different shapes that you see here. Many of them look like oriented bars with some curvature uh, added onto them. Uh, and Andrew's group was able to basically get these models to exhibit um, very interesting behavior close to, uh, uh, to some of the studies that had been done more recently uh, in trying to understand what, they, what the, the actual cells in area V1 were doing. Um, the, the basic inference that, that David, excuse me, that, that Andrew and his students were working on uh, was something that David Mumford uh, had developed uh, a decade, to, almost two decades earlier, it was something called the analysis synthesis loop, um, which has a remarkable uh, uh, resemblance to a graphical model as well. Uh, and the idea uh, is quite simple, and it has turned out to be an algorithm um, that is used commonly uh, for doing inference on graphical models. Um, this is the basic idea, uh, and those of you who have, who have uh, uh, done reviewing for NIPS have probably seen these exact same equations time and time again. It's become a real mainstay for lots of different kinds of inference, not just on graphical models. Uh, but the basic idea is that you try to reconstruct the data x um, as a linear combination of a set of basis vectors, um, subject to some constraints on, on, the size, on the size of the parameters that determine the basis vectors. Um, and you perform that operation uh, in, in, in order to optimize this objective function. Uh, and then um, you solve another uh, uh, optimization problem, this time holding the, the coefficients that you use to construct the linear combination of basis vectors, holding the basis vectors constant, where again you use your reconstruction error plus some penalty function um, that captures uh, a, a notion of sparseness. Uh, and in their original uh, work uh, that Olshausen and Field did, uh, they characterized this as a graphical model and gave it probabilistic semantics. One thing that uh, irritated me, or has irritated me, about sort of the progress in this field uh, is that we seem to be admired uh, in, in the very earliest stages of, of, the, of the ventral pathways. Uh, and there's been very little exploration of the dorsal pathways where, from my perspective, things start to get interesting. Um, the fact is that, that we haven't gone much further uh, than the original work that uh, Yuval and Wiesel got the Nobel laureate for uh, in trying to understand uh, the earliest portions of the lateral geniculate uh, and, and the striate cortex. The problem is that, that, uh, that in these early areas, the images are mapped on from the retina into the striate cortex, almost as though you're projecting a picture um, onto a set of, of, of uh, onto a screen. But that isn't the real picture about how we view the world. Uh, our eyes are moving constantly. Um, our heads are moving. Uh, our bodies are moving. Uh, we're having to integrate all these fleeting images uh, and stitching them together in, toward, in order to come up with a, a, a general uh, interpretation of the scene that we find around us. Um, and also, we're constantly moving between, between coordinate frames um, using uh, our proprioceptive, proprioceptive senses. Now, there's been work on, uh, on, on trying to figure out how we perform these saccades, these rapid mo eye movements. Uh, and the, the work of Lawrence City, Christoph Koch, and others on, in saliency um, was a, a good start at that. Um, and again, when I look at these models uh, that, that Koch and, and his students had worked on, uh, I see graphical models. Um, and we've been able to take some of these ideas and turn them into graphical models, give them probabilistic semantics, uh, and do reasonable inference. There's also a very complicated issue about how we take these, uh, these, these projections onto the retina, uh, or from the retina onto the striate cortex, uh, and we, we manage to deal with the fact uh, that our eyes are bouncing all over uh, and we're taking these disparate pieces. Um, one idea uh, is due to, to Bruno Olshausen, 
um, uh, Anderson and, and the fellow that we saw on the first side, uh, Van Essen, uh, on a, a model that captures transformations uh, on, uh, on these visual fields, these little patches, uh, that allows us to pu put them together and to provide this kind of stitching that I mentioned earlier. Um, we all live on metaphors, uh, that is, uh, uh, computer scientist uh, and uh, in particular, uh, neuroscientist and computational neuroscientist. Uh, we use models and metaphors and try to explain the world around us. Uh, and if it was uh, the, the ancient Greeks, um, they thought about water uh, pulsing through pipes and pumps and valves. Uh, uh, Laplace and, uh, and Descartes thought in terms of gears and ratchets and springs because clocks were the things that they thought were the mechanical characterization of the world uh, or how uh, mechanisms uh, were defined. Uh, automata, um, and then dominating most of the last 40 or 50 years, linear systems. Uh, but neuroscientists, real neuroscientists, the ones who put probes into monkeys and cats, um, they know that the brain is not linear. Um, it isn't, it doesn't, even, even the, the smallest parts of it in, in which you have the summation of a dendritic creed to come up with the, the, uh, the, the threshold determining whether or not a given neuron is going to fire, um, that combination is not likely to be linear. Uh, probabilistic models, on the other hand, graphical models, uh, provide us with a, a number of very nice uh, ways of thinking about the brain that go beyond, well beyond linear systems. Uh, the graphs themselves mirror biological networks. Um, they provide a compact distributed uh, representation. Uh, and the computations use message passing, uh, which looks like a form of spike coding uh, uh, information passing. Here are a few of my favorite models, and I'm going to go through them very quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, and uh, luckily, uh, Mike has already given uh, a nice characterization of some of the models. These are basically applications of some of the ideas that Mike and his students have had over the years. Uh, and this is uh, a postdoc of Mike's, uh, Eric Suter, uh, with the rest of his uh, uh, committee at MIT. Uh, and the nice thing about this model um, is it captures a much broader uh, uh, view of, of how hu human vision works. The notion of scenes, um, scenes composed of objects, objects composed of, of, of parts, mixtures of parts, uh, the parts characterized in terms of their appearances, transformations that would capture saccades, um, and positional information um, that captures the different frames of reference that we use to think about such things. Another model uh, that uh, has proved very useful in trying to understand what's going on in the earlier parts of the visual cortex um, and how we uh, reason about layout, uh, just the basic characterizations of a scene, such as uh, whether, what the background is, what the foreground is, uh, whether or not there are uh, large buildings or, 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 or pieces of vegetation in, in the view, um, that's what's referred to as layout. Um, and graphical models have played an important role uh, in trying to understand that better. And finally, one of Mike's um, actually contributions uh, with Eric while, while he was at uh, uh, UC Ber Berkeley uh, is, is something called uh, uh, dependent pit menuar processes, which are of a, a lot of interest to me right now because they provide you with a prior uh, over, over shape, basically, in, in a probabilistic fashion uh, in which the complexity of the model uh, is determined by the Gaussian processes. So, uh, what's the future of graphical models as, as they apply to brains? Uh, well, uh, a lot of it, in some sense, uh, is due uh, to thoughts that, that, that Yuda had uh, a couple of decades ago. Um, he provided us with algorithmic framework, um, a way of thinking about uh, how computations were performed in graphs. He thought uh, about the notion of cognition. Um, the, You've probably, for most of you have this etched into your brain, but you can't see it very well at the back. Um, this is a brain with a graphical model. Uh, this is a head with a graphical model for a brain. Uh, and people like Jeff Hinton and myself uh, believe that, that, in fact, that is a good characterization, a good way of thinking about these things. Um, these things have the ability to uh, provide rich representations, and they keep us honest um, by providing us with probabilistic semantics. Uh, and so, Next project? Um, I hope so. Thank you.